Hey everybody, welcome back to the Linux Cast. I'm your host, Matt. And I'm Tyler. How's it going? That actually didn't work out too badly. He remembered his <laughs> name. That's good. Uh, <laughs> and I remembered my name, so we should uh, mark this down as a win. All right, so this is the Linux Cast. We talk about Linux y things like normal. So this we, we took last week off. This week we're a day late. We have no schedule. And uh, <laughs> I, I totally forgot that the last episode we did, we streamed. So we technically mm-hmm. just could have streamed this, but I totally forgot. So no streaming Sorry. today. You'll just have to watch it, you know, after I edit it. And you don't get any of the good parts because all the good parts happen before we actually start <laughs> recording. So <laughs> anyways, uh, so Tyler, what have you been doing in Linux this week? To be honest, um, I've been doing, I mean, like, let's be real, like what we are always doing in Linux, ricing our tiling window managers. I've uh, I've been doing that in um, DWM. Really, I just changed back to purple, and um, I still it still needs a little bit more work. Um, but besides that, I've uh, gotten well. The, I, I did the rice so that all my PC and like lights here will show up. And this is the one thing that's really irking me. If you look back here, what color is shining on this wall? I see purple. You do? Yeah. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of bluish purple, but it's kind of purple. Dude, I, was, I had the lights off and it was like really bright. And we, I was in a Discord call with uh, I, Dylan and a few others. And everybody was like, yeah, that's blue. That's that's blue. I'm like, that, it, it's, it's definitely purple. But it, it, I, I was saying it, it was showing up blue. But anyway, I got my setup uh, purple and um, I got the K65 Mini uh, from Corsair. Put some custom keycaps on it, and uh, it's superb. And so, with this new keyboard, I have uh, not only did I get the keyboard because it's a nicer keyboard and I wanted something smaller, but also getting the new keyboard sort of uh, incentivized me to go back and relearn typing so that I could touch type. Um, and it's going well. Um, and by going well, I mean I I started touch typing, and I went from five words per minute to 25 words per minute in about four hours. So it's good. Good progress. Yeah, I was watching that stream where you were doing your your typing tests, and that inspired me to switch back to Colmac, and that lasted for about three hours. And then I went back to QWERTY. When you said that, I was like, I don't think that'll last long. <laughs> See, what I, I desperately need for Colmac to work for me is just a whole like week or two where I have to do nothing else other than do test typing tests the, the mm-hmm. problem is that's just never gonna happen because i have other things i have to do and mm-hmm. in, in order to, to really do that you have to switch everything you have to switch the keyboard layout you have to change the keycaps around and you have to redo all your key bindings because mm-hmm. especially in vim the vim keys just completely <laughs> are in totally different places so like in, in mm-hmm. order to get to insert mode that's no longer there because i moves down into where k used to be it's really weird so um, I really want. I really like the idea of Colmac. I just don't know if it's ever going to happen for me because I don't think I'm going to be able to put enough time into it to actually do it. Um, but yeah, I'm back on QWERTY. Um, and I mostly t- touch type. I have my own way of touch typing. It's not. I never use a pinky uh, on either side. I use mm-hmm. the other six fingers though. So I don't know. It's, okay. it's better than me. I, I I went from just doing using these two digits to now using all four, and I'm like, oh, that like I, it's an I- immediate notice. Like, yes, I'm slower, and I'm like I, I it, it's one of those things where like when you have muscle memory, um, and like you're you can type fast. Uh, it's still the incorrect way of typing, but still, uh, when you can type fast and you have that muscle memory, relearning typing where you've built a built your entire typing style completely wrong it it's so difficult like not only are you having to relearn something but you also have like ingrained muscle memory in you it's difficult i've tried to go through and incorporate the pinkies like i've tried like you know that they have the the thing that you were using where you you know it shows you how to do it i've tried but I, i i just can't do it um, mm-hmm. it, it's just too hard. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's after like hours and hours of trying to do it. It's just, I don't, I don't know if my pinkies are too short or 
they just don't want to work correctly. I don't know. Well, if we're going to be completely honest with how fast you type, I don't really think there's a reason to try and incorporate the pinkies. Because, I mean, like, what are you going to do? Get an extra two words per minute? Like, am I always... I mean, you want to do things correctly. I just always thought that if I could type correctly, but you're probably right, I probably would end up going slower. Um, I don't know. I still do a type. I do five or ten minutes of typing tests every morning. It's on my to-do list. I do it every morning when I wake up. And Mm -hmm. um, to be honest with you, I haven't seen a gain in typing speed in probably five or six months. Um, I've done this now for a year and a half. Like I've done type tests every single morning for at least a year and a half. And when I first started, I was at about 70 words per minute. And that's about, you know, average or so. And I saw good progression to the point where I got up to around 100 words per minute. And that's where I've stayed. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, it's weird because typing tests, at least when you're doing just the random word stuff, is uh, slower for me. Like, because you get a process like... I don't expect the word the to be followed by the, or the, I don't expect, you know, one word to be followed by the other because those words don't go together, right? You, they're mm-hmm. always random. And so that's no. always a lot slower. I can do hun- like about 100 wor- between 80 to 100 words per minute, depending on how I go. Um, but if I do a quote, like words that actually like mean something in a sentence, I can do 120 words per minute about. Um, mm-hmm. And then when I'm just writing, you know, like regular for work or whatever, I can do about that. Uh, in in yeah. spurts, sometimes it's like twenty words per hour. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> YouTube gets I, in the I, way. <laughs> <laughs> I think like mainly when it comes to those type of typing tests, I think the main difference is like when it comes to like an actual like proper sentence, uh, you can read a sentence and then as you're reading the sentence, following it up with typing. But when you're when, when you're given those random words, you have to take it one word at a time because there's no proper context for them. So yeah. you can't keep reading. You're supposed to be... The guys who can go really, really fast uh, are really good at looking ahead. So they can, they, they can know what the next five words are, always know what the next five words are. So you're always looking ahead. You just remember what the word is. And while you're slowly typing, you know, away or however slow you are, you you're continually like building up a cache of those words in order to continue on. So I've been trying to do that, and I can do it now so that I can sometimes be two. I'll, I'll my eyes will be two words ahead from where my typing speed is. So mm-hmm. it, it kind of works, uh, and it actually does make you a little bit more accurate because uh, you don't. If you know what word is coming next, even if it doesn't go with the word you're currently typing, you at least know what to type. Sometimes I'll type a word, and if I'm not ahead of myself, uh, I'll type a word that I think is supposed to go next. <laughs> but that's not <laughs> yeah. actually the word that's supposed to, that it's actually there. It's really weird. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, if Because back in school we had like um, Mavis Beacon. In order to do typing tests, Mavis Beacon. Uh, What's that? It's a typing test lady. It's a it's like a piece of software. You just come on a CD ROM. Well, actually, in that in that case, it probably came on a five and a half inch floppy disk. <laughs> because you got to remember, I'm older than you, man. <laughs> so mm-hmm. uh, the, when you took computer classes in in like elementary school, you got a, like a they handed you a five and a half inch floppy disk. You put it in the the separate floppy disk reader because the ones we had weren't built in and you could hear it cranking like like you it was like grinding noise and then mavis beacon would pop up and you that's how you learned how to type uh actually learned how to program uh with that kind of stuff too because uh you can go through and do i don't even i have no clue what like programming language it was it was probably something like basic or something uh Mm -hmm. but you know, you went in through and put in, like, I want this pixel here because there was only like 180 pixels for the whole string. <laughs> <laughs> and you put it, you, I want that pixel there to be this color. And then you could do animate it. You could animate stuff. It was really fun. Hmm. Uh, but that was, um, God, that was like the, the that would have been like 98 or 99 at that point. Uh, right. Uh, right before the, our school started getting like 
actual internet and real computers. <laughs> uh, anyway, so um, <laughs> we've already had tangents, Tyler. <laughs> We're already doing it. <laughs> it's okay. All right, so I have also been racing up a storm. I've, I've done four different races this week on DWM and saved them all in separate files. And I went through and uploaded them all separately to GitHub because uh, either on the stream on Sunday or sometime this weekend, I'm going to be creating a script where I can go through and change my rice based on a key, with a key binding. So I can do oh, like nice. a control, sh super sh control shift uh, letter or something, or maybe a key chord even. Uh, mm -hmm. And it will just change to the Dracula theme, or it'll change to the Grub Box theme, or it'll change to the Material Ocean theme, or it'll change to the Purple theme. Uh, and it's going to be really cool, and I've got it all planned out, so it should work. Um, I don't know whether or not that one will ever be something that anybody else can use, because it really require, is going to require like my file structure in order to work. But, um, mm. yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Now, I will go ahead and say this. Just in case anyone's watching this, and you want to see a nice, beautiful Dracula picture, like a Unix porn picture... Go over to my Discord and check out Unix porn. Matt has shared his screenshot. It is gorgeous. Oh, it's so, oh, it's so good. Uh, you will also be able to see it on the video that goes up today because I did a, a, a video on it. So, okay, mm -hmm. awesome, dude. It, it that looks so good. Like I've done Dracula things before, and they never look that good. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm really happy How with done? the way it turned out. It um, I even did uh, I did a cute browser today. And I added the um, Discord and the Telegram. Um, the The last thing I'll need to do is do the cute apps. Because uh, I'll have to use Cavantum to do that. So that'll be something. That, and that's always a pain in the tuchus to do. Uh, because you got to make sure you have the environment variable set in order to use the QTC5 or whatever the hell it's called. Uh, software. It's, it's just dumb. Anyways, I was also on uh, Tech Over T last Sunday. And mm -hmm. that was with Brody Robertson, and it was um, it was very fun, but it was very exhausting. It was three, almost three hours long. Uh, I don't know oh how yeah I don't know how long it will be when he edits it, uh, or I don't even know if he edits it. But I'm so glad that I don't have to edit it because <laughs> holy shit, um, I can't even tell you the number of topics we talked about. I'm pretty sure I hijacked his podcast because he had <laughs> topics, or he had topics we were supposed to talk about. He said at the end of it, we only got to three of the topics, but <laughs> it's not as if we just talked about three topics. Uh, we talked about probably 150 topics, but they were all ones that I kind of meandered through. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know whether or not I'll ever be invited back, but we did have fun. It was uh, it was very uh, it was very entertaining. But pardon, by the end of the, I was just so ready to be out of this chair. <laughs> like I can't sit here for that long. I'm so used to getting up every hour to stand at the desk for a little while. So if I ever do it again, I might have to stand at the standing desk. But now I hate to do this to you, but what you need to do is you need to replace that desk with the same desk that I have also peer, I didn't really peer pressure, but sort of peer pressured uh, TFL into getting. He was asking about a stand-up desk. I'm like, man, you should get the one I've got. He started looking into it. He's like, oh, it's not that bad. Not not that overpriced. So honestly, desks came up in Tech Over T as well. But um, uh, so the, my current setup is I had a stand desk behind me. It was like $100 at Amazon. And the reason why I have that instead of just like one like you have is because the desks that I'm sitting at in front of right now is an oak desk that's about 25 years old. And uh, it weighs uh, like a thousand pounds. Like this thing, once it's in place, it does not move. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, unless you don't want it to move because one of the legs is actually, you know, kind of <laughs> slanted because of termite damage probably. Um so when you type mine, type too fast, my monitors like shake. So it's not great. So I need a, like, I needed a new desk. But the point is, like, it's really heavy, and I don't know what to do with it. And um, <laughs> like, I could probably just like bring in a sawzall or whatever and chop it up into little pieces, and then put it into firewood or whatever. But it's just one of those things. I'm not sure I want to do. And even if I did go through and get rid of it, I don't think that I'd get a standing desk. Now they make standing decks that are like corner shape like you can do a corner shape but they're not quite mm -hmm. big enough for what i want to replace this with because if i'm going to do a new desk i want uh, a lot of extra space because i desperately need a third monitor like like mm -hmm. i so need one because i need more workspaces 
<laughs> I, I knew that was the reason. I knew it. <laughs> it's not really true. What I really need is just to be able to see more of my workspaces at the same time. Uh, but I can't fit them the way I have now. So I, what I want to do is, the, right now this is sitting up in a corner, and there's nothing over here against this wall. So what I like to do is get a corner desk that goes from the window, which is right behind my other monitor, and then goes all the way almost to the door. Uh, but the standing desks that are corner like corner shaped, they're a little bit smaller. Now they fit probably through monitors, but they won't be quite as big as like a regular L-shaped st- uh, desk. Mm-hmm. So probably what I'll end up doing is get one of those and keeping that standing desk back there. So I'll end up, mm-hmm. like you can't nobody can see this on on camera, but I'm in a fourteen by 14 room that's the whole room in this room i have a 48 inch oak desk i have that 30 36 inch standing desk i have a a full-size bed Uh, (laughs) i have a shelf and a dresser and a television on this little room there's not much plus you know me (laughs) so (laughs) there's not much room in here and i don't know how uh like an l-shaped desk would actually fit in here while also keeping that standing desk but I don't know. Okay. And if that if that L desk doesn't come apart like easily, or is uh, if if it's a real pain like to take it apart and get it through there, uh, that's gonna be a, like the only reason I don't like standing uh, L shaped desk is because I we had to move one out of a room and like those things you have to you have to disassemble them to get it out of a room. I mean clearly, and the one that we had, man, it took me forty five minutes to get that thing took apart. Like, it should not have been that difficult. Yeah. See, once I have it in place, it won't move. There's, cause there's mm-hmm. nowhere else in this room it could go. Um, it's just, there's, this would be literally the only corner that's available. I mean, it can't go in that corner because it has, you know, two doors there. So, um, I, I don't know. It's going to be something, it's going to be a while into the future because I want to, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to go through and redo the whole setup. So, like, look at him standing up in his standing desk. <laughs> yep. But uh, that's what I was going to say. This right here, just this feature cannot be understated. It's so nice. Yeah, I've, I've been looking, man. They're very, very tempting. Uh, mm-hmm. Because then I could get rid of that one. Uh, I could get rid of this one. I don't know. If I could find a, an L-shaped one that was b- big enough, it's possible. Um, I'm, like, I'm even willing to spend some money on it because desks are at like those l-shaped desks that i was looking at they're actually pretty cheap like 150 to 200 bucks oh really yeah they're not bad um i was expecting them to be like really expensive because those Same. last desks we bought where it was this fr- i mean like a real desk not that one uh mm-hmm. this thing here was like a thousand dollars but it's made of oak mm-hmm. i guess well, yeah like, that makes pure sense, yeah. fucking oak like literally that's the reason <laughs> why it lays a pound that somebody had to cut down like 12 trees just to make this fucker probably more um <laughs> It's good for the environment, I'm sure. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> uh, tw- it, it, well, I mean, it won't be bad for the environment like until you get rid of it. Then then somebody will make the argument that you're, you're not doing good for the environment. Well, see, I could try to sell it, but nobody's going to take a desk that is that wobbles, right? And it, I mean, I could try to, you know, fix it or whatever, uh, but... That seems like a dubious th- kind of thing, right? Like, uh, you don't want to buy something that's been fixed because chances are the person who fixed it doesn't know what the hell they're doing, and mm. it's still gonna. F- that's why I don't buy refurbished like electronics. Like the, uh, I mean, most likely they're gonna have fixed it properly, but you don't know the technician who worked on that that one device there could be overworked, half asleep, and just he got it to run, but it has like major issues. But hey, it's running, and he ships it out not noticing the issues. Like, yeah. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and move on. Yeah, twenty minutes in, we're we haven't even got to the contact info, but we we are we are now. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can do so on Twitter at LinuxCast. You can subscribe to all of our new all of our feeds and stuff like that at the LinuxCast.org. Once again, I would like to say I am working on the website, but it's slow going. Uh, eventually, sometime next year. Uh, <laughs> you can contact us uh, via email at email at the linuxcast.org. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the linuxcast. You can follow Zany, who's Zany on the internet. His name, real name is you know, Tyler. Uh, mm-hmm. You can follow him on uh, YouTube and Odyssey. Both of those links will be in the video description or the show notes. So you can click on those. Make sure you get there because he's like this close to a thousand subscribers. Mm-hmm. Like we're going to get him so there before close. the end of the year. Damn it. Cause Actually, <laughs> I have a nice little script where I can check. Uh, I'm all, I'm at 
I'm over 775 now. Yeah, see, he's getting close. Uh, I just passed, just like five minutes ago, 4,500. So, oh, uh, congrats. Yeah, uh, we're, we're still growing. It's, uh, I can't. The, the thing is, all right, so in the middle of the contact information, we're going to meander. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, As we should. The, the LinuxCast channel, not the podcast, but the channel, I started on September 5th, 2020, so it's just over a year old. Um, mm-hmm. And in that time, we went from zero subscribers to 4,500. So uh, <laughs> I consider this a very successful year. Um, obviously, I, I would too. <laughs> I don't know where I would be without the call out from DistroTube. So I um, have to shout that out and just say thank you for that. I do believe that I'd be at like around 2,000, but that's just me guessing because I was at. 450, 416 when that video was posted. So I was growing, you know, on my own, but I wouldn't be nearly where I am now. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a it's a year. So it'd be interesting. So you and I were talking, I think it was in the last episode, or maybe it was somewhere else, about Social Blade. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And Social Blade has future projections. So if uh, <laughs> you go to Social Blade and you look at the future pr- projections for your channel, it says that I'm going to be at like 67 or 6800 by the end of the year. Like, I don't know how that's going to happen. But the weird thing is, is it seems to be right. Because um, <laughs> like I checked like your channel and it, it, it showed when you were going to get to 700. Uh, and you were at 700 by that good day. Like, I keep track of other people's channels. It's really creepy. But, <laughs> like, um, I, I looked at DistroTube's future projections, and he actually beat it um, by, like, several oh. thousand. Uh, and because uh, it said, um, you don't believe me, I was shaking. I actually have a sheet of paper here where I you actually. have notes. <laughs> like, yeah, I do. So it said um, that DistroTube was going to be at 133,000 by September like 14th or whatever and he was like at 135 uh it says it said that i'm gonna be at 48.99 by october 8th and uh at this pace i'll beat that um yeah so it's, <laughs> it's i'm upset all right so here's the thing is i mean we're, we're still right in the middle of the context formation but i don't care so as you know i switched to iphone a couple weeks ago and iphone I keeps track did not know that yeah i switched to iphone uh and uh iPhone does this thing where it keeps track of how many times you open up applications throughout the day. Like, it resets every minute and midnight, and it will keep track. I mean, I think Android will do it, too, but I never used it. But the reason why I know iPhone does it is because it puts a w- widget on the screen to the side. Mm-hmm. And it says that I open the YouTube Studio app ten times an hour. <laughs> like, so, I, I, I think I have a little bit of a problem. <laughs> like, it's so dumb. Uh... On Android, it was worse because I had the, at least when I first, like, was first started, like, really growing, like, actually, like, at first I didn't care because nobody was watching the videos anywhere, so I was getting, like, five or six views a video, um, mm-hmm. which I was ecstatic about. I was like, there's people watching my video, even though, I, like, one of them's my mother, you know, like, you know, <laughs> it's one of them's your mom, uh, yeah. uh, but uh, once I started actually doing videos and actually started growing, I was like, I got that YouTube studio app and I was, I was checking it like every two or three minutes. It was the stupidest thing. I mean, nothing changed in between those things. Like every yeah. once in a while I'd get like an extra subscriber and I'd have, go out and have a party because all of a sudden, Ooh, I'm at five subscribers. I'm at 10 subscribers. Uh, Dude, now that I'm at the point where I'm getting multiple subscribers a day, like it, it's so different. Cause I'm so used to like, if I get a subscriber in a day, like, Oh, like that's amazing. And now I'm getting like handfuls a day where I'm like, Oh, I mean, like it's still really awesome, but like it, it's different because like I, at, at, when it, when it's just one a day, like you remember that username. You're like, oh, thank you, man. And then now it's at the point where I get so many where I'm like, oh, like wow, like I to me it's still amazing that I'm growing at the rate that I am. I genuinely cannot believe. I, I think it's mainly because I've started interacting with more creators. I think like like you. Yeah. So I I, th- I think that's really what it is. I'm I'm right there with you. I'm still sh- the thing like so like right now I've been averaging about twenty to thirty new subscribers every day. And I think that's spectacular, but I've gotten used to it. So on a day when it comes around where I get like eight subscribers Man, I'm so disappointed. I'm just down in the dumps, and you can just—I mean, my, it affects my entire, mood, which is the the stupidest thing ever. Because, like, I understand. I, I I'm so grateful for 
any subscribers that I get, mm -hmm. right? But you get so used to having really good days. So, like, I've gotten to the point now where all my videos pretty much always reach about a thousand, a thousand views. Like, that's about mm -hmm. my average now. And you know, it's still it's still growing really, really good. Uh, but that, um, that iOS versus Android one, that video mm -hmm. just completely flopped. It's my worst video that I've done in a month and a half. And mm -hmm. it just completely demoralized me. Like, I, I don't even know why I'm doing this more. I'm going to quit YouTube. I'm not doing it. It's just fucking stupid. Fuck you, too. And I'm just, like, like, <laughs> like, it was just horrible. I mean, first of all, it still got 700 views. So it's mm -hmm. not as if they're like, it's really. Uh, no. <laughs> my, mom, my mom just came in and tried to offer me food. <laughs> I'm like, I definitely want it, but <laughs> later. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, so, so I don't know. It's uh, man, it, being yeah, a like YouTube, being YouTuber is weird because <laughs> because mm -hmm. uh, if you find any amount of success, which I mean, forty five hundred subscribers or whatever, or even seven hundred subscribers, that's success of some kind. But then you go look at like you know Linus Tech Tips or something like that. Oh, like I don't mm -hmm. even have any subscribers compared mm -hmm. to that person. But it, it's all about you know perspective. Like I think, I mean. I was ecstatic when I had 700 subscribers. You're ecstatic when you have some... Uh, like, I don't even know what to do with 4,500 subscribers. Like, <laughs> like there, there are people who watch my videos. Like, why do you watch my videos? There is so much and, else out there to watch. <laughs> like, it, it, it's, it's the weird thing of, like, we all want the success that, like... Especially, like, when it comes into the, like, Linux YouTuber space. Like, we all want to, you know, get to the size of like Brody Robertson, distro to like s channel size wise. But then at the same time, it's so intimidating. Like if I had a hundred thousand subscribers, like what? Like that? Cause I, I would feel like that would change the way that I view like the, I, I did a video where I titled it literally just me uh, talking about a keyboard. Like that's literally all it was. And if, I'm surprised that that performed as well as it did. Like it's literally just, me talking about the key, my new keyboard. Like, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's going to be the biggest challenge as we both get, you know, bigger is to make sure we don't uh, change how we do stuff because that's how we gained, what, you know, the subscribers that we have is by being people that we are. So um, I don't think that that's going to be a big deal for either of us, um, mainly because... I don't think I don't think anybody's surprised by this, but neither one of us are doing this because we want to go out and get become millionaires. Um, yeah. <laughs> mainly because that'd be the most unrealistic thing ever. I mean, even yeah. if uh, even if we get up to DistroTube's, you know, hundred thousand, hundred thirty thousand subscriber count, we're still not going to be millionaires. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, like I could, sh like uh, like Tyler's not there yet, so he hasn't gotten to monetize his stuff yet. But eventually, he's we're going to get him there. Uh, but mm -hmm. I've been monetized since since like like March and uh, I've earned about $300. Oh, um, nice. And I'm ecstatic with $300, right? But mm -hmm. you can't live off $300 in six months. <laughs> no, <laughs> at least no. not in the United States. Maybe if you live in, uh, you know, Antarctica or something where you can't actually spend any money. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I mean, that's just on YouTube. I mean, I've earned quite a bit more on, on Patreon, which still just, mm -hmm shocks me that i have patrons I'm like, same right? i cannot believe like i well, it's not that i can't believe it's that i'm so unbelievable like i really hope the people who do support me over on patreon know just how incredible like that is like i really really do appreciate it. and i'm sure you do just as much yeah like, my first patron devon uh he's had some like technical issues where he's like doing uh change changing window managers or whatever and he asked me questions and uh like I, I will literally wake up in the middle of the night if he has questions to answer those questions because <laughs> that's how grateful I am that he gives me 13 bucks a month. Like, I'm like, seriously, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Like, so anyways, um, mm -hmm. believe it or not, we were in the middle of contact information <laughs> when we got there. Uh, so if you want to subscribe to the Linux cast, and we were almost done, literally was on the last line. If you want to subscribe mm -hmm. to Linux cast, you can do so at youtube.com slash Linux cast. Uh, I do videos almost every single day of the week. Uh, I stream on Sundays. I usually do some racing stuff. I do some ranty style videos. Uh, this past week has been very negative on the videos. Like all my videos have been very negative, but in tone, uh, I, I bitched about Vivaldi for like 15 minutes. Uh, 
there was a couple other ones. I don't even remember what they were, but uh, I I realized that I really need to start interspersing some more positive content in 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 my in my like, feed. Like I don't, don't get me wrong, I'm still gonna rant about shit. Uh, that's gonna happen, mm-hmm. but um, I don't want the whole channel to be 100 percent negative all the time. Uh, At least you're self aware about it. Yeah, like most creators wouldn't even notice that they've been posting negative shit for like two weeks. They just they just wouldn't notice it. It's just their videos. Like, and I don't know. It's it's nice to be self aware. Throw some different looks in there because I mean I I try not to do too many rants either and just go off on stuff. I don't want to. I don't ever want people to think that I'm a very negative person. Like I'm I'm really not. The the the, the best stream you've ever done. <laughs> and it's it's hilarious because usually it's me that gets you started. <laughs> um, I, I some oh it was the accounts based on GitHub. Remember the because you had to mm-hmm. sign into GitHub to use the dark theme. Yep. Uh, I dropped in there. You were doing something on GitHub. I was like, oh, GitHub has a, a dark theme, and you and you were like, really? How do you get to it? Oh, you have to sign in. And and an hour later. <laughs> He was still bitching about it. It was the greatest thing ever. Uh, I left and came back, and he was still going. <laughs> I was so upset. <laughs> no, it was it was great. I'm glad it was recorded because that's a moment of internet posterity right there. It, it reminded me of that viral video that went around a few years ago. The, it's like in black and white or something. The guy sitting at his desk, and there's probably a few of them like this, right? Because once one video goes viral, somebody else is going to copy it. But the guy sitting at his desk typing and you know it's an older video because he has like a crt monitor and his chair like breaks behind him so he he keeps trying to fix his chair and stuff like that and you, he just gets progressively more and more angry until the point where he actually falls out of his chair because it breaks out of from underneath him so he picks up the chair just smashes it across his desk the whole crt monitor goes flying he starts beating the shit out of everything in his office and then he just stomps on his the fucking chair and then he walks out the door that's the best thing ever it's so good I, every once in a while I go back and watch that that, that video because it's just it's hilarious <laughs> there's something amazing about seeing someone lose their crap like there's just some oh man that's why I don't understand why anybody watches my videos because you can go watch something like that and be much more entertained <laughs> I mean I know I would <laughs> anyways uh Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for subscribing and watching the videos. I really do appreciate it. But uh, once you're done here watching this, go watch somebody beat the crap out of their computer. It's going to be much more entertaining. <laughs> anyway, um, anyways, we're uh, 35 minutes in. <laughs> Just give you the news. <laughs> not doing too bad. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, this is actually fairly quick for us. <laughs> All right, so every week we uh, scour the interwebs to uh, find ourselves a news link to for us to share. And this week is no different. So, Tyler, what have you found us? Well, um, there is a new Ubuntu Touch coming. Uh, it's OTA-19. Uh, it's coming out, um, and it's... You, I mean, right now you could uh, do the pre-release version and do some testing on it if you wanted to. But um, there, this one I think is uh, a very interesting update, um, only because they're fixing some like some like really oh, ooh, voice crack there. Some that's how bad it is. They, they're fixing some really bad bugs um, and patching a whole bunch of security issues that they've had for. Um, some might say too long. Um, I think most people would say too long, but that's besides the point. They're fi- uh, fixing some much needed uh, security holes and um, it's going to be based on uh, Ubuntu 20.04, which is nice. Um, and this article here and them talking about this new one actually made me um, go and check. So I have an old Pixel XL and uh, they're rolling out uh, much more support for different devices. So if you have if you have an older device and you've been interested in trying out Ubuntu Touch or um, I don't know about other Linux um, oper- phone operating systems, how much they've come, but um, I went and checked and there's a lot more devices that they have added support for. And the Google Pixel, it's very close to being fully supported. Um, now, so, are you sure that it's going to be based on 21.04? Because it says in the article 16.04. Uh, 
No, uh, however, if you're looking for, uh, wait, hold on. Um, you, until you finally port Ubuntu Touch the, oh, wait. Yeah, it should be based on 20.04. Oh, oh, yeah, no, never mind, never mind. So like They're the, pushing to, to get to 20.04. Yeah. That, I misread it. <laughs> Whoops. Um, well, it's because you, you're probably so surprised that, uh, by the time they get to 20.04, 22.04 will actually be here. Mm -hmm. Um, see, now, I understand that they're a small team, right? They're just, you know, very they're small They're a very team. small team. Uh, but they're so far behind, man. They're just so, so far behind. Um, at this point, I'd say skip 20 out of 4 and just stay on 16 out of 4 until 22 out of 4 comes out. And then work for mm -hmm. that one. Uh, to yeah. See if you can at least get try to get caught up. Because otherwise, you're going to be trying to push to 22 out of 4 when 24 out of 4 comes out. And you're always mm -hmm. going to be perpetually four years behind. Um, yeah. Now, it's not a huge deal because 1604 is still supported. It's still getting security updates from Canonical. But it just feels like it's behind. So, you, I mean, and the, th the thing is that, is that developers aren't going to keep... They're not, you're not going to grab a lot of a developer attention uh, when they have to focus their app development on such an old platform, right? Because they're going to be yeah. developing for the new stuff uh, not the you know targeting the older platforms. So um, I really wish they'd find a way to be a little bit further ahead. Um, I do too, but I do I do give them the um, I I don't know what I was I I give them a lot of wiggle room in the fact that they're the task that they have undertaken is a it, yeah. especially for their team size is insurmountable. There is. The fact that it actually works on more than two devices is insane. They've done very good work. Yeah, um, makes you wonder if they would be better off with a rolling release model. Where it just kind of... Like, the, they just keep, you know... Uh, improving on the packages individually over time and then the, those go out instead of having to do one package here and then another release you know a year from now that's all you know the same thing they just constantly are reiterating on things kind of like i mean maybe a partial release you know where the kernel yeah. and the underlying base stays the same but the packages are always being updated uh, I, don't I don't know how Manjaro, uh, like the phone edition of Manjaro, or the, I guess it's ARM, but anyway, for, made for phones, the phone mm -hmm. version of Manjaro, I, I'm i pretty sure they actually, like, it's not actually rolling release, it's held back for a little bit, yeah, it's like and then implemented. Too, yeah, Yeah, because I, I the, the problem with doing the roller, or, I don't know that this would be the problem, but I would assume this is probably very likely. If you go the rolling release model, especially when it comes to this type of de development for phones, um, you you uh, it's a it's a pick and choose. So you you either do rolling release, which means the software is going to be much more up to date, but you have to focus on um, not only m making sure that the new updates don't break anything, or fixing those in the software side of things and so it, it holds you back in especially again with a team this size it holds you yeah. back in being able to add support for other devices so it's a do we work on older software that's still stable that we can work on adding more support for or do, should the software be the best that it possibly can i think yeah it's, it's a probably six of one half dozen of the other kind of thing mm. Now, I mean, if they had the development power of, you know, like much bigger, like Linux teams, I feel like they could definitely do both. But with their team size, it's got to be difficult. Uh, I mean, yeah. all around what they're doing is difficult. Well, that's because <laughs> so. there's so many phones they have to target, right? It's just so many. Every phone has a different chip. It has a different GPU, different, you know, modem and all this stuff. Uh, Man, and and they're starting from scratch. Like there's, yeah. they don't have any work to build. Like I mean, I don't envy them. Samsung, the Samsung ain't giving Ubuntu Touch or any Linux distro some help when it comes to making software or making an OS for their device. Well, and their they're, new ones won't even probably allow it at all, anyways. Because once you you unlock unlock the bootloader, you your your camera stopped completely working. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it blows. Uh, anyways, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of these so. <laughs> Somebody asked when I made that iOS versus Android video why I didn't switch to a um, switch to a Linux phone. I was like, "Well, I need applications. 
Um, and I people knew- have asked me why, like about you not getting a Linux phone. Like they've asked me, and I've had to tell them, like, well, he likes Clash of Clans and stuff. Like he can't just leave and people will get like why don't you like they, they try and tell me to peer pressure you to switch to something that you wouldn't work for you like what that makes no sense like for me linux on uh, for me linux on mobile is where linux itself was like 25 years ago mm-hmm. um where it's really cool uh, you can get it to work, and it can be your daily driver if you really, really put a lot of effort into it. Uh, but you, and there, you're willing to make compromises. Yeah, and that's the, important. It, there's going to be things that you're going to miss. Uh, and app support is just going to be one of them. Uh, that's the way it was on Linux back in the early 2000s and the 1990s. You know, it had some applications and good alternatives that were being developed, but. Uh, for people who just got, are getting in, into Linux, you are spoiled rotten compared to where Linux was 20 years ago. Um, e- even even 10 years ago, you have no idea how much you're spoiled. Yeah, like, um, so <laughs> just be very grateful. And, and that's where Linux on mobile feels like it is to me now. Uh, and the thing is, is that Linux itself was developed much faster because it got adopted in the enterprise and, you know, a lot of people were using it and that it doesn't feel like a lot of people are using Linux on mobile, whatever variants there are. Uh, and yeah. that's going to be a problem for gaining people to develop the applications. So if you get like a, a UB ports thing, what you're going to get is you're going to get the applications that UB port itself has uh, developed for it. Now there are other applications stuff like that because uh, like GTK, the later GTK stuff and uh, GTK four and stuff like it is is been developed in order to uh, entice developers to make their uh, apps responsive. So when they get smaller, they you know they continue to function. So you could use like uh, Nautilus or whatever on both the desktop and the the phone, and it's actually the same package. Uh, mm-hmm. Just it's just responsive like a mobile like a website. Um, mm-hmm. So that's going to save things too and that's that's why i think that the the ub port stuff is more interesting than the plasma stuff because uh the plasma stuff is still doing that kind of stuff too but it feels like it's further behind a little bit in terms of that area plus um well i i rail against gnome and its lack of customizability on the desktop on the phone I don't really need that customizability until it works. I mean, mm-hmm. if UB ports and the, the GNOME based stuff that they're doing is, uh, you know, was perfect, and then then I'd want to rice it. Uh, mm-hmm. But first, make sure I can make a phone call and do a text message. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and hey. if we're being completely honest, I I feel like this is maybe universal. It's probably universal. If you look at Plasma and then you look at GNOME, GNOME has the appearance that oh. This works on desktop, but it, this could easily be transferred over to a phone UI. Yeah, because it's all plasma. Simple. Not so much. Yeah, no. I mean, obviously it can, but still, like if you take a visual first impression from the two, I think you're going to go with GNOME is probably the more likely one to make into a phone UI. I Just, think I think plasma will get there, uh, but I think it's gonna. I think they're a little bit behind. But now you got to remember, I haven't used either of them, so it could be completely off base but either way uh the reason why i can't switch to it is because i need uh games and applications and stuff that just aren't available on linux on mobile yet so uh, so um now this is going to be a complete tangent before you get to yours real quick now that you have an iphone are you now buying airpods a macbook a mac computer all that stuff you're doing it right no Uh, but i have (laughs) have thought about an apple watch um because those are really cool as someone who has one, they're really nice. They're really nice. Um, yeah, because I just started exercising again. And I kind of want to get into the, you know, closing the rings kind of thing. Like, maybe it'll keep mm-hmm. me motivated to do it this time. Um, so I've been thought about it. The problem is $400 seems, I mean, I'm, I'm the guy when I want to watch, I go to Walmart and spend $20 on a watch. Same. I'm too <laughs> cheap. I'm too like, cheap. Like, I don't, uh, like, it took me a while to get away from t-shirts, and now I have these collared shirts, and I look all spiffy and stuff, but um, mm-hmm. this is about as dressed up as 
fashion wise I'm ever going to get. Uh, mm-hmm. So I don't need a thousand dollar watch uh, because it tells time just as well as that twenty dollar watch that I got from Walmart. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, and I have. I worn- also don't want something on me that I'm probably going to lose. Like, I mean, if you let's say you go out with friends, you get a little hammered. What happens when that watch just like and, and if it's like I mean if it's a twenty dollar watch you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, you I mean, lose your a thousand dollar watch. Jeez. Uh, yeah, you're devastated, uh, and that's that's, yeah. that's one of the reasons why I'm a little iffy on the 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 iPhone the Apple Watch because it's four hundred dollars. I mean you can get the cheaper ones, but I mean if I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna get the new one. Uh, yeah, and um, I'd be very very worried that I'd either lose it or I'd break it or. Uh, or I wouldn't use it, you know, it's possible that I yeah. um, try, because I still have my Android phone here, there's a good chance that my SIM card goes out of my iPhone into the Android phone sometime in the next six months, because I mm-hmm. that's why I have both of them, I can switch back and forth. Um, well, I will go ahead and say, if when it comes to the watch, as somebody who owns it, um, if you don't wear watches all the time, don't buy it, because I'm someone who doesn't typically wear watches, so mine collects dust way more than it should. Yeah, I'd have to, so. I'd have to force myself. My biggest problem when I was wearing watches because I always decided that I wanted the biggest fucking honking watch that I could get because I have <laughs> I have a big meaty hand right I mean this thing takes up the whole camera right so I can't get one of those little puny ones because it would make me look like I was wearing a woman's watch like, <laughs> like, like, like somebody asked you are you wearing a woman's watch no it's just I have a big ass fucking paw here and it needed you know it's a regular size watch you know yeah. uh, you're the so, opposite of Linus Tech Tips you don't have them tiny hands no 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 <laughs> I, I, got, I got big meaty man paws <laughs> alright <laughs> what's we, your news link <laughs> we're, we're, by the way we're almost an hour in we haven't made it to the main topic yet <laughs> This is ridiculous. Uh, all right, so real quick, my link is Raspberry Pi based Pi KVM goes to Kickstarter. So basically, from what I understand, that basically this is something you could hook up to like a computer or a server or something like that that would allow you to interact with it and turn it on and turn it off and stuff like that with uh, this little tool here. And it sounded really cool. So um, I'm obviously not an expert at all, but the um, reason why I linked to this is because the Raspberry Pi just seems to constantly uh, allow people to do really neat things like this thing here, um, and you know there's NASs and there's keyboards and there's full blown com- full blown computers that do use the Pi now. It's just so good, and it always makes me think, Matt. Why have you never had a Raspberry Pi before? <laughs> like I've never had, I've never owned one, and I I always look at one like it's not as if they're expensive or anything. I spend more on stupid shit than I you know. Like I spent thirty dollars on a Twitter client, by the way, on iOS because <laughs> don't get me don't get me started on that. Um, it's dumb. What you spent thirty dollars right. on it? I have to get you started on it. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So. Uh iOS apps have moved almost universally to a subscription model for all their in-app purchases. So Mm -hmm. if you want to get uh, any of the features or you want to change themes or anything on any app, pretty much, you have to spend $4, $10 a month to do this. Uh, Sometimes it's like $30 a year. Even that to me is too expensive because I do not want a recurring charge for any application on my phone. I just, I don't. I, I, I couldn't justify $10 a month on an app. I don't care what features it gives me. Yeah, I, see? I couldn't. Uh, but the thing is, is I do almost all of my Twittering on my phone. Like, almost all of it. Hmm. Um, I mean, I have TweetDeck on my computer all the time, but most of the time, I'm on the shitter, I'm on Twitter. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what you do your t- Twittering, right? Yep. And yep. I was like, hey, that rhymed. <laughs> 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 Anyways, uh, but so the application on iOS that I used to use when I was on iOS before was called Tweetbot, and it's really good. And they've always had a paid model and a free model, and the free model was just like pared down, and you could give them money. And I was like, a, I always gave them like the ten dollars every time they came out with a new version. It was like every couple of years. It was fine. That was the way you're supposed to do it, you know, and just. Here, have a little bit of money. I like supporting third-party developers or whatever, even if it's proprietary software sometimes. Uh, mm-hmm. 
So I downloaded that again, and they moved to the Switch subscription model. And uh, I was like, first of all, fuck no, I'm not giving you any amount of money recurring because I'm going to forget about that recurring charge. Mm -hmm. And I'm still going to be 95 years old and still paying for a Twitter client that hasn't been Mm -hmm. developed in years. Right. So uh, I was like, well, I'll just use the free version. But it turns out you can't even tweet from the free version. You can't tweet. You can't retweet. You can't do anything. It's just a viewer, uh, at least as far as I could tell. Yeah, it's dumb. Uh, so I don't care how well designed your app is. That's just dumb. So I'm not giving you any money. So I downloaded Twitterific, and Twitterific also has the stupid subscription model in order to get rid of the advertisements, which were really annoying, and do several things. But you can use the free version, and it, it's fine. Um, but I want the like I said, the ads are really fucking annoying. So I went into the pro version. I was like, you know, fine. I'm gonna figure out a way to. Fine, I'm gonna find a Twitter client that I just I can just give them some money and get rid mm-hmm. of the stuff. I can get thing. Uh, so that's how I ended up spending thirty dollars on a Twitter client because they have a lifetime uh, oh. thing where you can just give them thirty bucks and you have mm-hmm. all the features for as long as the app exists. Um, yeah. So that's how I ended up with thirty dollars. So when I got this phone, I budgeted myself fifty bucks for applications because it, it's been I haven't used an iPhone since twenty eighteen. I switch back and forth every three or four years, so I knew that I was going to spend some amount of money on applications. Um, mm-hmm. I what I did not expect was that. Of like a, two-thirds of my budget would be spent on a single application. More now. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, that is... Uh, it, it, uh, I, I've told the story now a couple times. I did it in the video iOS versus the Android. I said I talked about it on Tech Over T. Um, and I understand people are looking at me like, Matt, you're a fucking moron. <laughs> like, <laughs> how, like, how are you not homeless right now? Because you obviously <laughs> have no money sense whatsoever. Uh, well, I think the really sad part would be if you stopped using Twitter in like two months. Yeah. Like, I think that would just be the real sad part. Yeah, I don't think that that's going to happen. I've been on Twitter since 2009. Uh, I'm pretty well addicted to it at this point. Uh, I mm. do a good job of staying away from the nonsense Twitter, like the politics and stuff like that. If you talk about politics, I don't, I don't follow you. I just I follow people who do technology and Twitter and Linux and stuff like that. And it's my little niche, and it's fun. It's you're fine. Uh, mm-hmm. So I don't I don't have the problems with Twitter that other people ha- seem to have, but. Um, the, the real thing is that eventually uh, I will switch back to Android and then that $30 will look like an even stupider purchase because I can't mm-hmm. transfer it over. Like, it doesn't happen. But the thing is, I've spent money on Twitter clients on Android before, but it's never been that expensive. It's usually 10 bucks. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. 10 bucks makes sense to me. Like, 10 bucks sounds like a good price for any application. It does, I mean, if you get some use out of it, 10 bucks seems like a reasonable price. $30 mm-hmm. seems really, really high. That's steep. That, that is steep. But apparently, that I mean, they realized... See, the thing is, Tyler, is phones used to be... Like, an expensive phone used to be like 600 bucks. When the first iPhone came out, like $600, that was too expensive for people. And Apple, like a month and a half later, lowered it down to 500 bucks. And even that, and that, and that was at the point where you signed a two-year con- contract and got it for like 50 bucks. You know, mm-hmm. all the contracts and whatever, they lowered... they. Uh, I don't remember what the word is, but they you know incentivize you to, to buy this stuff. I mean, they still do it these days, but whatever. Um, the problem is, six hundred dollars now. You're like, oh, that's a really cheap phone. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, what's wrong with it? <laughs> you know? Now, now six hundred dollars is a budget phone. <laughs> like, like, well, I mean, it's not. I mean, really, it's not because I mean they ha- they have two or three hundred dollar phones. Um, yeah. And but I'm talking like budget flagship. Yeah, You're going to get all of the features of a flagship yeah. phone. Um, and then you have like the, the iPhones and everything, like the main flagships are like $1,000 and can go up to $1,100. And then you have like the foldable phones that are like $2,000. Like, first of mm-hmm. all, man, I have like top of the line. I have a Ryzen 3800 and a, 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 a Radeon card in here. And I got all everything in that computer for like 1500 bucks like mm-hmm. all of it brand new and that's cheaper than you can buy a fold uh, like a Ga- samsung fold for like uh for the same price as a galaxy fold you could go out and get yourself a nice beater car to get you from point a to point b and that thing would last you as long as you treat it right for like three to four years easy yeah easy yeah like right. Well, I mean, then people people buy that those phones every couple of years. So if you take that eighteen hundred dollars that you're going to buy the second time, spend the second time, and put it into that car, it will get you even further down the road. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> like, like every every two years, you put that eighteen hundred dollars and you replace the tires and the you know the the brakes and stuff, and you know you, you got a car probably for the for rest a long of your time. life, man. Yeah. You're good <laughs> as long as you replace the oil. Just remember, replace the oil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just phones are too damn expensive, and it's just so dumb. Like this. All right, so I did not get the latest iPhone. I bought an 11 Pro Max, which is two years old at this point, mm. and it was still $800. Ooh. And by the way, this was not a new phone. It was a refurbished phone. So I didn't even get a brand new phone, uh, and it was $800. Um, and I considered that a fairly good buy because it was done. Uh, it was refurbished done by a you know, company that I trust, and, um, and because like the the... The phone from last year is still going for like twelve hundred dollars, uh, even mm. though the the thirteen just came out, and it, so that didn't go down in price at all. And I was like, well, you know what? Maybe I won't switch to iPhone this time because I, you know, maybe I'll just pick up the the Samsung from last year. They still mm. like, you, it used to be the Samsungs they'd come out and almost drop in price almost immediately. That didn't mm-hmm. happen this time. It's still like twelve hundred dollars to buy the, the 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 most recent Samsung, just not the the non full kind. The you know the Regular, just a regular bog standard Galaxy S twenty or whatever the hell it was, uh, mm-hmm. and that's <laughs> like that's like, uh, this is the most expensive phone I ever had. And for the first like four days, I didn't have a case. The case that I ordered was like hadn't come yet; it was still in the mail. Yeah. And I was freaking out the whole four days because I just knew I was going to drop this damn thing, and I was going to be so mad at myself. So. I got the OtterBox thing, like it was. A, it's like a twenty dollars case, and mm-hmm. now I'm and I got a screen protector on here, and I, now I can be as rough with it as I need to be. Uh, I'm much more calm about it now because if I've yeah. broken this thing, this thing has to last me for three years, at least. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I'll be pissed. All right. Um, oh yeah, that main topic thing. You know. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, now. We're at an hour long. <laughs> Epic. <laughs> you guys are getting an extended podcast. I hope you're All happy. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I. All right. So our main topic for this week. I, I'm. Who, who? Who? Whose topic was this? I think this was. Um, this topic was. Uh, good Lord, notion. I think this it was, was yours. Yeah, this was my topic. So we can. Uh, oh, good. That means I'm supposed to remember what I was thinking when I came up with this topic. Great. <laughs> so, all right. The question we have to ask ourselves today is, does Linux have a future? And what I was thinking of this was because I've heard several Linux podcasters talk about Google's fuchsia. Mm-hmm. Um, and they all seem to think that in the future, everyone's going to transition to using Google fuchsia as their uh, operating system of choice for servers and devices and everything. Um and I don't know why people think that this is going to happen. I'm very confused because, as far as I'm aware, Fuchsia does run on a device. It's like a a, a, like a photo uh, player or something. I don't even know. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's really, really, really early days. And I don't like. I'm not as well read up on Fuchsia as I probably should be. But do you think that eventually, whether it's Fuchsia or something else, that something will come out and displace Linux? as it is right now, uh, you know, to be the main, like, server-based operating system. Because, obviously, we're talking mostly about servers here. Yeah. Um, I I don't know. Like, I I feel like there, there, there definitely will be something that... It won't kill Linux, but displace it eventually. Um, I But for me, I, I think it's more likely that there's going to be, a, like, a BSD that just rapidly improves and it's like to me like i think in the server space like if if open bsd was to somehow get uh for some reason a lot more attention a lot more dev work um and the hardware uh support and like enterprise support for open bsd was to like vastly increase over a couple of years i i have a feeling that like when it comes to servers and like what actually runs the internet open bsd would be probably the thing that comes over just because of its heavy focus on security. Um, 
But when it comes to like servers and something made by Google, like a lot of servers too, like they won't even, a lot of servers don't, people who run servers don't actually end up using Windows only because the support isn't worth it. And a, lo a lot of the times the, there's a prevailing theory, which is definitely very accurate that the NSA has backdoors into just about every major operating system uh, made by companies. And so I, I, I think there's a, uh, in the server space, there's a much more fo focus and desire for a very secure and uh, stable system. And I don't know that Google will be the one to do it. Yeah. Um, All right. So here are my thoughts. Um, Microsoft got their toehold into security or into server and enterprise basically by default because mm -hmm. they people were familiar with Windows, so therefore they kind of just went on and uh, decided that they were going to use Windows for their server base as well. Um, Linux has like crawled into that space and become very dominant. I don't see a future where a company chooses to use a Google-based operating system willingly simply because it's controlled by Google. Like, if, mm. if it was today and Windows was just coming out, I don't think that companies would go through and use a Microsoft operating system simply because it was based... It was it came from Microsoft. I think that they're there because they were kind of there, you know, by default. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that... Google has the trust to be an operating system used by other people in the enterprise space uh, on their servers and stuff. Now, I could be completely off base on that because people do use Android, obviously, but it feels different to me. Like you, tr if you have like other servers that manage your Android phones and stuff like that. So you still have some control over Android and stuff. And Android is based on Linux. So people have that underlying idea that at least is somewhat open. Mm -hmm. um, and you have some control with your management stuff and stuff like that. Uh, if you also have uh, a Google controlling your servers, then you have even less control. And I think that the reason why Linux does so well is because no single company has control over the kernel. Now, obviously, the Linux Foundation, which does the Linux kernel, is supported by every major corporation but they do it as a pool like none of them have full control and i think mm -hmm. that's why linux is so um appealing to companies because you know that it's not just google having control over the whole thing it's not just microsoft having control over the whole thing it's a, a, a vast group of companies that put towards resources and it's controlled kind of like adjacent to the linux to, to those companies because it's controlled by you know Linus Torvalds and, and you know mm -hmm. the Linux maintainers and stuff the same guys who've been doing it from the beginning so I think that's the reason why Linux has been so successful in the enterprise space it, I to answer the question you know finally after that long meandering thing mm -hmm. um, I think that it th the thing that will eventually replace Linux is just another version of Linux because I think that eventually uh, the kernel will get so big that it has to start being pared down. Like some mm -hmm. of the legacy stuff is just going to eventually have to go away. And we've already seen that mm -hmm. st stuff go away. Uh, things like floppy disks and, and stuff like that has been pared out, you know, and you can still get that, but you have to get older versions of the kernel. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I, I think when it comes to enterprise too, uh, one thing that we can't overlook is the fact that Google is a massive tech company. And if you're an up and coming tech company or um, for that matter, just a company in general, you probably don't want your trade secrets um, or just the secrets of your company to be managed by a potential competitor. Um, and, also, too, I, I I think even even in the enterprise space, like I mean, we're we're all human, okay? And he, I I feel like as humans, it is very scary the fact that Google owns essentially the almost all, if not close to all, of human knowledge. They well, yeah. they don't own it, but they control it. Yeah. Um, and so giving them more control over 
like enterprise and business um, trade secrets stuff like that. I I don't even know that the government, like any government, would let that happen because that's it's just too risky. Yeah. Uh, well, that and the thing about Linux is that it's international, right? It's it's developed by an international team. No single com- country has you know control over it either, and. Uh, if Google, let's say Google's future ended up being really good, it'd be really hard to get that outside the United States because very few countries are going to trust a uh, uh, an operating system that was solely developed on by a, con- a company here in the United States. And we see this now because a lot of governments and stuff like that are moving to Linux uh, for that very reason. They don't want to have to rely on Microsoft. Now, what I was saying is that I think what, what comes next is a complete re- like. A, it's not going to happen right overnight, but I think slowly over time, the Linux kernel will kind of transition from being written, you know, in assembly in C++ into something like Rust. Uh, and mm-hmm. it will kind of be, it, it'll kind of be the same thing, but a lot of the older stuff uh, will just kind of fall by the wayside and not get worked into the new kernel. Now, whether it's Rust or some other programming language, I don't know. Um, and I, But I still think it's going to end up being Linux. It's just going to be uh, in in a new development language, and I they've already been talking a lot about incorporating Rust into the kernel. Um, mm-hmm. it, it hasn't happened as far as I know yet, but I think I think eventually it will happen. Uh, mm-hmm. Because while C plus plus is still very popular, the number of people who are studying C plus plus and are experts in it is slowly dying out in favor of newer languages like Python and and Rust and all these other things. Mm-hmm. So eventually they're going to have those new la- newer languages are going to be into the kernel, whether Linus Torvalds likes it or not. So I think that mm-hmm. I think he the way he looks at it is that this is going to happen. We might as well uh, make sure that as it happens, it's very well monitored, and it's just not something that we do all at once, very forced because somebody else came in and did a takeover of it or something. Um, mm-hmm. By the time he retires or something, I don't know. Um, yeah. So. It's it's going to be very interesting to see what the future of Linux is, but I don't think maybe this is just the optimist in me, which is weird because I don't usually take that role. <laughs> but I don't think that Linux is going anywhere, just simply because. But I think that Linux will transition over time to something a little bit different. Just you know, because eventually the legacy stuff will have to go away. Yeah, so. I I completely agree. Yeah. So, so for those Linux podcast out there who thinks that Fuchsia is going to be like the future of everything, um, I don't think so because I don't think that people trust Google enough. Maybe no. I'm just hopeful in that area that I hope that people don't trust Google enough. Um, yeah. Because if, if we come to a point where uh, Fuchsia is on all the super compute computers and rules the enterprise world, we're, we live in Google world. Which mm-hmm. we basically do already anyways in the consumer place. So anyway, yeah. But at least now we can pull a veil over our eyes, and it's not not as noticeable. It's not you know, well, it's not as clear as day. We can use Linux, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Linux still exists, and we need to fight for that future. Make sure Linux stays existing. Yeah, because I mean, if I would really like to not live in a world where Fuchsia is the standard, and if you're using something else, like there's a lot of stuff you have to give up. That rather not. Well, do you really want to use an operating system from a company that abandons things like Google does? Because eventually they'll get sick of Google, they'll get sick of Fuchsia and move on. That's the reason why they're doing Fuchsia in the first place is because they're sick of doing Android. Like, mm-hmm. they, like they want to cancel Android eventually mm-hmm. so and move on to the next thing. That's what Google does is they move on to the next thing. I wouldn't be surprised if the link for Fuchsia is like the uh, link to like almost like the link to Stadia now, where you just go to it and it's like a four hundred four error, like or at least it might as well be <laughs> like it's dead. Like this people, do people still have? Hey, did you even try Stadia? Did you try Stadia? Mm-mm, I did try Stadia. No. Um, now you gotta remember, I'm not a gamer, like mm-hmm. uh, like a PC gamer. I'm not a gamer, PC gamer, like at all. Um, I tried it and it was um, it was okay. It, you know, like. It was fine, uh, but there not a lot of games there. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's not a lot of games there. Now I've heard GeForce Now is really good. 
because yes. it go, it'll go through and it'll tie into your Steam library and you can use all your Steam games there. So I'm going to try that out because that sounds really fun. Uh, and I still can't get Battlefront 2 to actually work. So um, I, I will go ahead and say, just so you don't have like your expectations too high, um, even though it does work with your Steam account, so you don't have to like buy games, there, it, it, it won't have all of your Steam library there. So it probably won't have the EA Pass stuff there, which would be really disappointing. Yeah. That's what I really yeah. want it for. Because like I said, I cannot get Battle the Star Wars Battlefront 2 to work. Uh, I press mm -hmm. the play button, and nothing happens. Like, it will go through like the Vulcan stuff that it does every once in a while for the first launch. And then nothing after that. It just hits play, uh, pauses for a minute, and then goes back to the play button. And I don't understand. Now, I thought maybe it was like, maybe I'm missing a dependency or something. So uh, I checked, and I didn't have Wine installed. So I installed Wine and all the Wine stuff. I thought, well, I tried it again. It still didn't work. Like, hmm. I don't understand. Now, the one thing that I will say that typically ends up working is you don't have to use it. But if you if you go to uh, Glorious Egg Rolls Proton and you download that, uh, you have to go through like the install process. And one part of it is getting yourself out of Wine Dependency Hell. And like you, you got to install a whole bunch of dependencies. And um, for some reason, I found that that doing that improves regular Proton's compatibility and like performance quite a bit. All right. When you uh, get a chance, send me the link to that, would you? Um, yeah, no problem. We'll do. Because otherwise I'll forget. Because, um, yeah, the, I, I really want to play that game. Like, I remember playing the game from ages, but I can't get it to fucking launch. All right. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, what's hilarious is we spent an hour on bullshit and then 10 minutes on the main topic. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's okay. Um, at least we made it to the main topic. That's, you know, That's what that. matters. That's what, we've done that before. All right. So every week we do picks. We, it's can be an application or something else. It, it literally can be anything. It usually ends up being an app, um, but it can be anything. So Tyler, what is your app of the week this week or pick of the week? Mine is Liquid CTL, and um, you can go to their GitHub, find it there. Um, it is a fantastic uh, CLI tool for managing your AIO water coolers and um, different RGB devices. It, it's primarily for AIOs. Um, but it does work like, uh, inside of my case here, I have a Corsair case and it comes with, I think it's called the Corsair node, but it's where you can hook up, um, like RGB devices to it and control it through that. And that works fine in liquid CTL. Um, so does my AIO, um, it's not a hundred support with like a hundred percent support with AIOs, but, uh, as long as you have a mainstream, like popular water cooler, it's, it, it, it should be supported. So it's mostly just um, to control um, RGB, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can also set fan speed, pump mm -hmm. speed, stuff like that. All right, that, that makes too. sense. As I was going to ask you what the difference was between this and open RGB was. Yeah, they, uh, the only difference is it's like it has the same functionality as open RGB, but with more aimed towards AIOs in particular. Cool. Um, and and that that's what I really like about it is because I've I've used Open R, uh, RGB and I typically do use it, but I've been able to replace Open RGB with Liquid CTL completely. And because it doesn't come with a GUI app, oh, I, I'm pretty sure you can get Open RGB without a GUI. But anyway, um, just because it's not really an option, it's much more lightweight, which is mm. nice. Cool. Um, I have no RGB. I don't know if that makes me a loser or what. Because I no. I can't see my computer anyways. It's behind the monitor, so it doesn't really matter to me, but I uh, I have no RGB. And, like, to be honest, the only reason I have RGB is because the stuff that I wanted came with the RGB. Like, uh, I, I don't know. I'm not one of those people who goes out of my way to have my computer, like, light up. I mean, I, I really don't get the mindset behind someone who's like, it makes my computer better. I, I, I don't. I mean, we were joking. You adding you add racing stripes to your car. Of course, it's going to go faster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Uh, so my app of the week is. Let me see if I can see this. It. It's called Better Tweet Deck. So if you if you not the type of person who spends thirty dollars on a Twitter app, um, and you just use a free one called Tweet Deck, you can actually download this browser add-on called Better Tweet Deck. It's available for Chrome, Safari, Firefox, Edge, and Opera pretty much all of them, uh, you can download this and it will actually give your tweet deck a whole bunch more options. So you can change the 
size of the columns more freely. You can go through and add a whole bunch of options for multiple accounts. You can change the color of the icons and the color of the application to some app, some at least a few different colors than what stock TweetDeck allows you to do. And there's a ton of just little little tweaks that make TweetDeck more powerful in terms of you know uh, how you retweet from multiple accounts, how you like things from multiple accounts, it saves you a few clicks for that. Uh, it's really good. Um, somebody on Twitter pointed me towards this, and now I can't really kind of do without with it because I have mul- I have the Linux Cast account and I have my like personal account. Mm-hmm. And um, basically, what this will allow me to do is when I hit click the like button on a tweet or whatever, it will bring up a little window and ask me what account would you like to tweet from. Um, hmm. And uh, you can do this through regular tweet day too, but it's like four or five extra clicks. And this way, this just comes up and I can hit, you know, like from the Linux cast or whatever. And then I don't go through and like it from my personal account, which, you know, I tweet out regular, you know, nonsense with. So, uh, yeah, that's better tweet deck. I'll obviously links, links to both of these will be in the uh, the show notes if you want to check them out. So, uh, yeah, so that are that's our picks of the week. And I don't know what it is about recording videos and doing podcasts and stuff, but usually by the end of it, I have the itchiest fucking nose. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's like for, for me, it, for me, it's always like, I don't know why, like I'm not sick or anything, but like towards the end of a podcast or a long video, my nose starts running. I don't understand why. I, I'll never understand why. If someone knows, like I'm sitting here, I'm rubbing my nose. Like you guys probably think I'm picking my nose. Like I got boogers up here or something, <laughs> uh, but no, it's just itchier than balls. <laughs> <laughs> And that didn't even help. It's like, <laughs> it's so, so stupid. Anyways, so that is it for us this week. Uh, coming up next week, we're going to be talking about make new software or just contribute to exi- existing software. That's Tyler's topic, so that should be very fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and before we go, I should take a moment to thank my current patrons, if I can remember where the button is. Devon, Chris, East Coast Web, Gen 2 is fun too. Marcus, Meglin, Sven, Jackson, Knife, Jewel, Joshua Lee, Mitchell, Art Center, American Camp. Thanks to everybody for watching. We'll see you next week.